Harry, uh, let's start. You're on track to graduate in mechanical engineering. How proud of that achievement are you? I'm very proud. Um, uh, you know, when I was going through recruiting, a lot of um, a lot of universities, when, when I said, you know, I want to stay engineering, they said, like, well, we, we don't really do that here. Um, either they don't have engineering or, like, they're not going to let a football player do engineering. So Ohio State was very unique in that respect. It was one of the main reasons why I chose it, because they let, they let me, they encouraged me to study engineering. Um, it was very difficult, lots of, lots of long hours, especially while playing football. And, I, and I'm just sort of thinking about this cohort of, of classmates I have who for the past you know, several years, we've gotten really close just making our way through this curriculum, through this you know, campaign of mechanical engineering. And so I'm really excited. Yeah, just eight weeks, I think, until graduation in December. So it'll be very exciting. That's a team unto itself. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We've got a group chat. We've, um, you know, we haven't cured or we haven't you know put a rocket on the moon um but we've uh we've we've finished some heat transfer homework together and, and figured things out like that so i'm very proud of them yeah you, you've applied for a road scholarship marshall scholarship yep. how do you think you've handled your mental health while trying to uh accomplish these academic feats i think um, better, I've handled it better than other times, but not the best that I could. I think that's the case at all times. Um, you know, it's, it's dangerous, and I don't want to create the illusion that because I've talked about my mental health publicly that uh, it's a cure-all and now it's, I'm, I'm better and I don't deal with these things. I deal with these things. However, now, you know, I'm very, I think the biggest thing is I've learned to communicate while experiencing um, depression or anxiety or suicidal thoughts um, before as with a lot of mental health problems, it makes you reclusive, it makes you not want to communicate, yeah. which is the last thing you need to do when you're experiencing those things. So now you know, I've developed a lot of tactics to, to just give my friends, my family a heads up, let them know that I'm okay. And <clears throat> you know, before, I, I sort of like metaphorize it as, you know, I have these, sometimes I have glasses on my head with this dark gray tint and that makes everything else look gray. And before, you know, I'd really catastrophize and worry that the world was gray. And you know, now I realize that it's just a pair of glasses. That it's, it's no reflection of, of what things actually are. And um, you know, so it's, it requires a sort of, of course, correction in my thought process sometimes that you know, things aren't a catastrophe, things are OK. And um, so I've, I've developed good tactics, but it can definitely always be better. How goes the fight, the crusade of your baby, don't make it weird? Because to me, it's, it's, it's a thing. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I hope it, you know, continues to go well. I'm not like I'm not a good, um, <clears throat> I'm not a, you know, an entrepreneur or somebody who's like trying to to grow a a, a brand or identity or something. It's sort of just something that came about and, and felt very natural. And it was "Don't make a weird" was a phrase that I was saying over and over again to people. And um, I think that's sort of the the essence is, you know, just to just to not make it weird. Um, it feels very. I don't know. I, I don't know a single person that I've talked to who hasn't had some relationship with mental health, whether it be themselves or somebody they care about. And in which case, if we have something so common, um, it's 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 sort of staggering how we've we've put it on this pedestal. And I think fear, fear and shame really are pedestals that an illness, no illness deserves. Um, you know, it, for a long time it felt like um, you know I, I try to hunt, hide under my blanket because. You know, I'd see a boogeyman in the corner of my room in the middle of the night, and then you turn the lights on, and it's just a pile of laundry. And it's, I, I think we just need to get the collective light on and stop, you know, uh, aggrandizing and, and fearing something that we can, we can fix. It's something that we all experience. So for sure, don't make it weird. Um, yeah, I hope, it, I hope it continues to catch on. I think it's, I think it's a catchy little phrase, so um, I enjoy it. I think you've normalized the discussion of mental health. Yeah. I've talked about... I would have never said anything about my own issues, you know, uh, until, yeah, until you came about. I mentioned Malcolm Jenkins in the book and his own, uh, he considered committing suicide and all of his friends after they read the book were just floored because they're like, you're, are you kidding? You won two Super Bowls. Yeah. You, you're a high achiever in athletics you're out in the community, the whole thing. And he said, check on your strong friends. And so it really becomes 
check on all your friends. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah. I, I think you have said, and many others have said, we're all fighting something, correct? Yeah, for sure. And I think um, we were just, we were talking earlier and I talked about, you know, I have this, I have a perspective given my <clears throat> engineering background where, you know, if a, if a cantilever beam of steel is subjected to 5,000 newtons of force, it's going to experience extreme stress. And if the steel's strong enough, it's going to look like it's not deflecting. It's going to look like it's as if, it's, if, it's, if, it, as if it bears no load, sure. um, which is a falsehood. And it's not fair. And it's, and it's you know, really a dismay to the strong materials out there who, who bear loads. But because they are so strong, it appears, as if they, it appears as if they don't. And then people subject other loads to them. And as we were also talking, it's ironic that the hardest materials, the strongest materials, are the brittle materials, and whereas, you know, metals, and this might be like an a quick engineering lecture, a material science lecture, <laughs> whereas metals like steel are ductile and they'll bend before failure, and there even comes a point where they can bend and revert back to what they were originally. A brittle material, a strong material, a hard material will fracture and, the pr and it'll propagate instantly and the thing will shatter. And I think we have a high expectation for those strong people. And it's ironic that the strongest and the hardest are also the most brittle materials. And it's not to, brittleness is not to suggest weakness. In fact, yeah. it's, it's quite the opposite. So I hope we can, we can redefine how we view strength and brittleness, ironically, uh, simultaneously. How impactful do you think your work in DC was? Tell me about the team's uh, act. I think, yeah, uh, DC has been fantastic. Um, they, it was actually, the Teams Act was just introduced to Congress by representatives Booker and Bozeman. Okay. And um, yeah, it'll, it'll get resources to, to uh, research mental health with, in the student athlete population, which as I was talking to, to Dr. Doug, will be great to extrapolate to you know, veteran groups or, or general population groups. And I think it's awesome to study this demographic of superheroes um, in this way, and not only because the, da the data is, is outdated, and not only because it's a group that needs it, but because it is, it's a group that can be role models to other groups. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful. There's a great team out there um, with, you know, uh, Colton and Kaylin I just, I just saw recently, and it's a really great network of student athletes who, uh, who care about it. So it's been awesome. Yeah, you got a lot going. I, I would call you the Renaissance man. You're, da right. you're dabbling in media, written a book, short stories. You produced a film in New York City. Yes, yeah, so actually, yeah, so started. You Min actually Factory. do 48 hours a day is yeah. the way you do this. Yeah, started Mint Factory Productions because um, we only make fresh stuff. And uh, with, with Jake Ray and Cooper O'Hearn, we went to New York, filmed <coughs> about a 25 to 30 minute short film. And, in two days, which is quite an endeavor, and um, it was it was awesome. We we had to film a scene. You know, we're filming a scene of a, of the, of this main character's main moment, and you know, a, a homeless person sleeping behind us on the subway, and it's uh, it was very guerrilla. It was very boots on the ground, and um, it was a great experience. And I just I just love being um, creative. I lo it's something I actually got into. It's something I always wanted to get into, but never really gave myself the permission to do until Candace, who is my sports psychologist, um, sort of at the, at the very start of when I worked with her, um, she said, well, I want you, I want you to start writing. If that's something you want to do, do it. And uh, she sort of gave me the kick in the pants to get started. And since then, I've, I've written a couple short stories, um, two novels, the, the latter of which is around 75,000 words. And so I have about a, 140, 150,000 words of written material that going to try to publish or, or convert into screenplays and, and do some stuff with. So lots of, lots of projects and lots of uh, knickknacks all over the place. Where can we see the film? Is it um, nowhere yet? Can so we consume it? We're in post-production. It will okay. be consumable. Okay. Um, we're looking at avenues to, to release it, um, but hoping to, to release it by the end of the year. We're in post-production now and, and working with a really great team of colorists, composers, sound guys. So um, it's been awesome. I think we've covered some of this. What do you think drives you now? And how would you describe your progress over two, three years now? I don't know. I guess I'm thinking about drive, um, you know, because for a long time, as we were talking about, um, you know, I, I started playing football in second grade because I was bigger than other kids. <coughs> and 
I played football in third grade because I played it in second grade, fourth because I played it in third. I played, I played college football because I played it in second grade. And sort of every year, every, every time fall came around and the leaves start changing, it's like, well, it's time to play football again. And that's not really an experience for me anymore. Um, there is no, and, it's, and I'm grateful that there is such momentum yearly to, to keep reinvesting myself in this way. But you know, once you retire from a sport, that goes away and you have to find something. Uh, I think for me now, um, you know, I think, I don't know if this is cheesy, there's a, there's a Latin phrase, Nemo vir esquimundum non redat meliorum, what man is a man who does not make the world better? And uh, I don't know, I, I figure I'm here, so might as well get to it, you know? And uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have had an experience, I'm grateful to be able to talk about an experience, I'm grateful to have some skills here or there that, you know, let me pursue scholarships or creativity. And uh, I figure I better use that. And, uh, you know, so it's sort of what I'm getting after now. I, there's nothing I'd like to, I'm excited to hopefully evolve and, and grow and um, do lots of things and not sort of get chained up as a football player or even as a person who had an experience with depression and suicide. Um, I think that's what's so exciting. And one of the, the main reasons why I wanted to keep living was because there was you have the potential to edit my life every single day and revise it and make something better and better and better every day. And so, you know, I'm excited to have a lot of things ahead of me. I just want to do them the best that I can and uh, just do good uh, and, and help others. You have. I appreciate that. Um, let's discuss your relationship with uh, Sonder Mind mm -hmm. and how important it is to connect uh, a patient perhaps with the correct therapist, psychiatrist, um, how how did that impact your situation? I mean, when you went to Coach Day and they said, "Hey, all right, let's do this," uh, and that's what these people do, right? Yes. So, Doctor Doug. Yeah, it's been great working. Um, you know, Sundermind sort of Sundermind elicits an experience, which is an experience that I had very similar to myself, right? Where um, I was experiencing a crisis, and I needed I needed a quicker I needed a team I needed a, re a response team, right? Uh, initially, it was, it, was, it was my mom, Coach Day, then Candace. Um, and it became larger and larger. And I was, I was, these, these relationships were made. And I was fortunate to have that facilitated quickly because I was an Ohio State football player. Not other people have that opportunity. Yeah. Not other people have that accessibility. And for me, it was great. It's sort of, you know, Candace sort of felt like, she felt like a coach in her own respect, right? Where, um, you know, just like, I would be told by a position coach or a coordinator or, or coach mm -hmm. day, um, you know, we got to, to work this scheme, this play, this concept, these steps. Similarly with Candace, it's like, well, I want you to do this. I want you to work on this. I want you to think about this. These are some things that you need to work on. And so we worked on them. And so I think it's, it's incredibly important to be put in, uh, in contact with those people. And like I said, I was fortunate enough to get that quick. Some people aren't aren't that fortunate. So having a, a, a service, you know, such as Sondermine is, is incredibly useful. Uh, are you, do you keep up with the team? I know you obviously you, you have relationship with those guys you played with. Very much, yes. Yeah. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm at the Woody pretty much every day, um, you know, getting, getting a workout in before class and I, I see the guys every day and uh, uh, I, I really, I don't know if I, I value a place on campus or in Columbus as much as, you know, sort of like the, the, the mess hall of the Woody, right? Where, right. Um, you know, all those circular tables and uh, just the place of many great conversations and many great relationships. And so I'm very much, you know, a part of the Woody and, um, you know, I'm, I'm just very, I'm very grateful. And it's, it's a great experience to be able to interact with those guys still because, uh, again, my case is very unique. I know, I know cases of other football players or other athletes who experience a mental health crisis and they're sort of, you know, hush, hush, shoot out the back door. And, and that's, that's a terrible tragedy to be, you know, deprived of, of friends, which, you know, isn't the case for me. Yeah, you're front and center now. So can you, do you call your guys? Do you say, hey, uh, let's run the ball. I mean, everybody's like, uh, we're, we're good, but we're 96 in the country yeah. in rushing. Uh, how does Harry fix that? Oh, I mean, I can't. I'm just, I'm just a guy. Like, it's, it's sort of... I'm so grateful to see, like I think of Donovan Jackson, who was my little brother, and um, to see him do so much better than I did his sophomore year, and uh, it's, it's sort of great to see 
all those guys outgrow and surpass anything that I could have done. Like I think of, I think it was like Cicero who wrote to us and he said, you know, you're the only man I want to see um, surpass me in everything. And I think about that with like all those young guys like Donnie and Carson and um, be better than I was. Be better than I was. And they, and uh, in many respects, they already are. In many respects, they are going to be in so many fields. And um, you know, there's little things, and we were talking about, like, there's, like, little football techniques and um, about, you know, how to, how to block a nose and get to a linebacker, which is a pain um, <laughs> when you have, you know, one hand between your legs and you're trying to rip through a shoulder and this guy is sprinting as fast as you can this way while this guy's grabbing your, your, your chest plate. And um, it's, there's definitely, you know, there, there are easier things to do. Um, and so there's, I mean, there's technique stuff about that, but, you know, really, if I have a role, I just like to view my role as uh, just um, keeping inventory of how the guys are, you know, because I know very easily, like I, uh, I know how easy it is to, to get lost and to get confused. And um, so I just try to check on with guys. I know, uh, I don't know, there's, there's a look you can see in, in guys if they're okay or not okay. Um, and I know that look because I had that look. And whenever I see that, I just try to check in on guys and make sure everything's okay because uh, you, can, you can get lost in, in all of the traffic of, of everything. So just check in with the guys. Talk about that burden uh, of, of being in this preeminent program in the fishbowl in Columbus that has a million and a half, two million people and a lot of keyboard cowboys out yeah. there who have to tell you what you're doing wrong. It's extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult for me. I'm a person who, I mean, I was, I was a Valley Twin in high school. I was a, a top ranked person at my, a top ranked player at my position. I, like, I, I was a perfectionist. I wanted things to be perfect. And of course you get to a point where the competition is so excellent where things can't be perfect. And you're going to make mistakes. And it's difficult to make mistakes in front of other people. And some guys take that better than others. I, I know, I, I, like I said, I took it very personally. And, uh, you know, it's very, it's very difficult for me because, like I said, when I, when, when I, I, didn't sign, I didn't sign any contract to start playing football in second grade. And somewhere along the way, I ended up here in Ohio Stadium. And um, it's a very strange, the game becomes more than a game. And I always, I always found it very interesting how, um, you know, if, you ha if you're a player who has, an, who has a, an experience, say with a fan or somebody saying something, and you take it personally and you get upset, yeah. the rebuttal is, well, it's just a game. But it's not just a game because we have, we have made it not just a game. There are coaches' lives involved. It's a billion dollar business. And when you start saying death threats and insulting me, well, it's not just a game and you have made it so. And, you know, that's sort of, it was, it was not just the fact that you know, to receive these things, but when you wanted to respond to them, to be told, well, what do you, this is just a game. This is, this is the same thing as when you were in second grade. Well, it's, it's not the same. It's become something different. And, um, but of course, it's, it's sort of um, speak when angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever, ever regret. Speak when angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. And uh, it's just so difficult because any act of retaliation comes across as emotional, emotional immaturity. Um, but, you know, for me, when I, when I felt like there was, when I felt like there was no response, when I felt like, you know, this isn't for me, and I felt like I couldn't, there was no rebuttal, I was like, that's, suicide became incredibly enticing, um, because it, it felt like, it felt like the, the biggest way to get out of this, because if I said anything, I'd look like a chump, or I'd look like a preteen, or I'd look emotional, and um, I said, okay, well then I'll, I'll just, I'll get out of the way on my own terms. I'll drift away. Yeah. And so wow. it's extremely difficult, and that's why I check, on the, check in on the guys so much, um, because it is, you know, once you're there, once you're um, shoved up onto this podium, uh, where do you go from there? And so I definitely check up on the guys. Harry, anything else you want to add? No, um, definitely just, just don't make it weird. Um, check up on your people. Check up on the people who look strong and appear, um, you know, you look at a bridge with... 15, 18 wheelers and it doesn't move an inch, that's not to suggest that it's not carrying a weight, right? It's just incredibly well made. And I think there are incredibly well made people out there, incredibly tough people, incredibly hard people, incredibly strong people who bear a lot, who bear a great load, but because of their strength, they're not going to receive help because of it, because they're expected to be so strong. So 
check in on those people. Perhaps that's you yourself. And if that is you, you yourself, then, then get help. It's OK. And um, yeah, we can, we can adjust the load. We can figure something out. So um, that, that would be it. Harry, I appreciate your time. Appreciate your candor. For sure. And for folks who want to see the entire interview, that'll be available on our YouTube channel at ABC6. Thanks again.